before the completion of the Human Genome Project, most biologists expected to discover a large number of active protein encoding genes. Many put the estimates at or above 100,000. In 2004, neuroscientist Eric Nessler remarked that, and I quote him, people were a little surprised when the human genome was sequenced and it only contained 30,000 genes. This is not all that different from a pot potato. <laughs> On top of that, he added, and we were a little insulted to uh, be so close to a potato. Um, now, putting aside any potential slight to Mr. Potato Head, perhaps the most surprising thing about that discovery was, in fact, its capacity to surprise. Because now, uh, with breathtaking speed, today we are seeing breakthroughs in the fields of genetics and biology that occur with striking regularity. And there are a few scholars working in the field today whose work better exemplifies these advances than Sarah Tishkoff. Ten years ago, she and her team of international scientists undertook the largest African genetic study in history. Starting with field expeditions, they collected blood samples from more than 7,000 people uh, representing more than 100 ethnic groups from Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad, the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Sudan, and Kenya. And from these samples, they began the process of extracting and comparing DNA. This past May, led by Tishkoff, the team published a genetic map of Africa that sheds new light on all humankind, our origins, our evolution, and our future. It reveals Africa to be the most genetically diverse place on Earth, pinpoints the origin of modern human migration in northern Africa, and locates the exit point out of Africa near the middle of the Red Sea. Her study also reveals that genetic mutations and linguistic diversity have co-evolved among populations. She is also using her data to study the genetic basis of resistance to infectious disease and to study the variation of drug metabolism genes across geographically and ethnically diverse populations, two areas that have broad and potentially important impact on our study of global health. At Penn, she is the David and Lynn Silfen University Associate Professor with appointments in the Department of Genetics in the School of Medicine and the Department of Biology in the School of Arts and Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sarah Tishkoff. So thank you very much for that nice introduction. I'm so pleased to be here today to be able to share with you some of the work that we're doing in my laboratory at Penn. And this combines my interest and um, interdisciplinary background in anthropology and human genetics. And some of the questions that we're interested in looking at or exploring are, what are the genetic variants that result in the clear differentiation of humans from our closest uh, genetic relatives, chimpanzees, and what are the genetic variants associated with normal variable traits in humans, things like height, for example, or also uh, disease risk? So I wanted to start by giving you a little bit of background information about what we know about levels and patterns of genetic diversity in modern humans. So after the sequencing of the human genome in the past five years or so, um, and also the sequencing of several other non-human primate genomes, we know that we're about 98.5% similar to chimpanzees at the nucleotide level. And we're considerably more similar to each other, somewhere around the order of 99.99 or so percent similar. So we know that if we were to look at the genomes of any two of us in this room, we would differ on the order of about one position, if you're looking along the chromosome, one position every 500 nucleotides. And the nucleotides are the basic um, components of DNA, G, A, T, and C. So if you just scan along the chromosome, about every 500 position, there's a difference on average, 500 to 1,000. So that corresponds to roughly 10 million genetic variants that can occur in many different combinations and result in the uniqueness of each of us. One thing that's just starting to be explored 
is that we now know that there's a considerable amount of structural variation in the genome. What we mean by that is that there are pieces as small as just a few of these nucleotides to millions of them that are deleted from the genomes, or they're inverted, or there could be extra copies in the genome. So we're only at the beginnings of understanding the implications of that. For example, it's thought that this could play a major role in some diseases like autism. And there have certainly been some cases where we know there are structural rearrangements in the genome that uh, play a role in autism and other disorders. But if we were to compare across populations, we know that the majority of genetic variation, about 85 percent, is within populations and only about 15 percent across populations. And that's simply a reflection of our evolutionary history. It's thought that anatomically modern humans arose in Africa in the past 200,000 years. The earliest um, fossil evidence that we have for modern humans is in Ethiopia, dated to around 200,000 years ago. And it's thought that a small group or groups of people, as small as a few hundred, it's been estimated, migrated out of Africa within the past 50,000 to 100,000 years. Now, it's thought that there may have been two paths of migration out of Africa. There was one that went um, a southeastern path into southern Asia and then into Australia, uh, Melanesia. The earliest archaeological data we have for modern humans in Australia is dated to about 40 to 60,000 years ago. So they've been there for quite some time. There was thought to be another distinct migration into Europe. Uh, we do not see anatomically modern humans in Europe prior to about 40,000 years ago. There were Neanderthals, a distinct species, that were there as long as 200,000 years ago or so. And in fact, modern humans and Neanderthals coexisted for some period of time. There have also been more recent migration events, for example, into the Pacific Islands in the past few thousand years. Um, and across the Bering Straits, around 15 to 30,000 years ago, populating the Americas. But Africa, remember, is thought to be the source of all modern humans. And here I'm showing a picture of just some of the individuals that we've studied throughout Africa. And you can see just superficially, there's quite a bit of, of variability in these groups. There's a lot of cultural variability, linguistic variability, and I'm going to show you quite a bit of genetic variability as, as well. And we want to identify the genetic and environmental factors that play a role in this normal variability that we see in different populations. So first, I have to give you a little bit of background information about um, African history and African language linguistics. There are over 2,000 distinct um, ethno-linguistic groups in Africa. So that represents about 30 percent of all the languages in the world. And these have been classified into four major language families, which I've shown here. So the Afroasiatic speaking populations, shown in blue, are mainly in North Africa and Eastern Africa. These would include, for example, Semitic speakers, who also extend into the Middle East. And also in Ethiopia, um, Eastern Africa, a uh, mainly Cushitic speaking people. In red, we have Nilo-Saharan speaking people. And these would be, for example, the Maasai typically pastoralist populations from North Central and Eastern Africa. The most um, widespread group are the uh, niger kordofanian speaking populations, the most common of which are the Bantu-speaking groups. And Bantu languages are thought to have originated in Nigeria or Cameroon roughly 5,000 years ago, and then there was migrations across um, a broad range of Sub-Saharan Africa. The last language family consists of populations that speak with a click, and I can't do it. People have asked, but I'm sorry, I can't. <laughs> but that would be, for example, the Kungsan. If you saw the gods must be crazy, those are the um, so-called Bushmen hunter-gatherers that are featured in that film. Now, they also have some of the oldest genetic lineages in the world. We know that. So they're thought to descend from a very old population. But there are two other groups in Tanzania called the Hats and the, and the Sandawe. They also speak with cliques, but it's been a big mystery how they're related to these southern African clique-speaking populations. So there are a number of reasons why I think it's particularly important to study genetic variation in Africa. 
And for one, as I just told you, it's thought that modern humans originated in Africa. So if we want to learn more about modern human origins, we need to be looking in that region. Secondly, there's a large interest in the African-American community to learn more about ancestry. And again, we need to have characterization of a broad set of African populations. Africa, unfortunately, is also a site, uh, a place of a very high amount of um, infectious disease, with the three uh, biggest killers being HIV, malaria, and TB. So if we want to have a better understanding of the genetic basis of resistance or susceptibility to those infectious diseases, and then which will hopefully lead to better, more efficient treatments, we need to look in Africa. We also know that there are a number of common diseases prevalent in Africans um, and African Americans, such as prostate cancer, hypertension, and diabetes. And there are some methods for trying to find genetic risk uh, factors for those diseases that rely on looking at ancestral African populations. And lastly, we know that people differ in regards to response to drugs. And this may be due to variation at genes that play a role in drug metabolism. And currently, we know almost nothing about variation in these genes in Africa. So to develop more effective treatments, we're going to need to look in that region. So I, hopefully I've convinced you it's really important <laughs> to study Africa. Yet when I um, was working on my PhD at Yale, <laughs> I'm afraid, the other school, um, there was almost nothing known. And one of the reasons, there are a number of reasons, but I think one is that it's so challenging to get these samples from often very remote regions with a lack of infrastructure, political instability, and so on. So for the past 10 years, um, myself and my students and postdocs have been doing field work um, in Africa. We mainly work in, uh, with minority populations who are in generally pretty remote regions. And I wanted to just show you a bit of what it's like to do this work in the field. This is that group I told you about, the Hadza, who speak with a click in Tanzania. And um, we, were, we were very careful to do this research in as ethical a manner as we can. So that means having to get, go through multiple rounds of ethical review at the university, then the government level, the village level, and ultimately getting individual um, informed consent. We also got detailed ethnographic information for um, each individual. And then we measured a number of normal variable traits, like height and weight. I'm going to tell you about our study of lactose tolerance. We've looked at things like bitter taste. How do people taste different bitter substances? And you can just see how challenging it is to do this work in uh, these remote locations. For most of these samples, we've obtained uh, blood. And then we have another challenge, which is how are we going to process it with no electricity? So in this particular case, we hooked up a centrifuge to the car battery. But in most places in Africa, it doesn't matter how remote, you can go to the most remote region, you will find a mission hospital somewhere within at least driving distance. And they have a generator. So then we can hook up our centrifuge. And what we do is from the, uh, the blood, we break open the red cells. We spin down the white cells that are these little pellets at the tip here. And those are what have the DNA. We can then um, add a, a, a buffer to these samples that basically stabilizes the DNA, and we can carry them back in these boxes at room temperature, so we don't even have to worry about refrigerating them. So the first study I'm going to tell you about today is the study that was recently published in Science. And we looked at roughly 1,400 variable markers across the entire genome. And this was the largest study to date of Africans. We had over 3,000 Africans in our study from about 120 ethnic groups. We also looked at 98 African Americans from four regions in the US. And then we had a large comparative data set from outside of Africa, roughly 1,500 people. This is showing the distribution of the populations that we studied in Africa, mainly uh, places where we've done field work. But although it's pretty comprehensive, we're missing data from a number of regions, like North Africa in particular, Central Africa, and Southern Africa. The first result I want to show you is a measurement of genetic variability, just overall genetic diversity. And the height of the bar indicates how much diversity there is. So higher the bar, more diversity. And in orange are the sub-Saharan African populations who are consistently the most genetically diverse out of, compared to all other populations. 
In blue, we have European and Middle Eastern populations, red Southern Indian, uh, pink East Asian, green Oceanic, and purple American Indian. So you see this decrease in diversity as you move west to east across Eurasia, um, and consistent with this pattern I showed you of a history of migration events across that region. So this is too small detailed for you to see. Any of the details here, I just want to show you the general picture. From all that genetic data, we could estimate genetic distances or similarities between pairs of populations. And, po and then we can construct a phylogenetic tree. So populations that are genetically more similar are going to cluster near each other in that tree. And what we found is that populations generally cluster by major geographic regions. So here are all the Indian populations, Central Asian, European, Middle Eastern, East Asian, American, Oceanic. Here we have North Africa. And even within Africa, they clustered by geographic region. So we have East Africa, West Central Africa, and Southern Africa. Now there's one exception here. In green, or actually they're not in green, they're in yellow here, are the pygmy populations from Central Africa who cluster with those Bushmen, the Kungsan from Southern Africa. And I'll get back to that in a moment. This is another type of analysis we did. It's called principal components analysis. And now we're moving away from populations and we're looking at individual ancestry. So each one of these circles represents a person and if they're genetically very similar to another person, they're gonna to cluster together. And we can see differentiated here are all the African individuals, here are non-Africans. Then we can distinguish American Indians, Eurasians, Oceanian populations, and here, we have that Hadza group of hunter-gatherers that speak with a click in Tanzania, very distinct on a global level. If we do the same thing within Africa, all of these outlying groups are hunter-gatherers. And they're probably differentiated because they've had a long history of being very small population sizes, and very differentiated, they've had time to differentiate. Interestingly, within, um, in the other populations, we see that they cluster by geographic region again, so Northern Africans, Eastern Africans, Western Central, and Southern Africans. Now this is another type of analysis to try to look at individual ancestry. Each of these, you can't see it, but they're composed of lines, and each line is a person. And each color represents an inferred ancestral population. People can have multiple colors, indicating that they have mixed ancestry from different regions. So down here we have the non-African populations or individuals, and we can see that most individuals cluster by, by major geographic regions. So in blue are Europeans, Middle Easterners, Southern Indians, um, we have East uh, Asians, Oceanic, and American Indian populations. People from um, Central Asia show mixed ancestry from East Asia and probably Middle East or Europe. But the, what I want you to note is all the different colors here in Africa. So that's indicating a huge amount of genetic diversity comparable to what you see on the entire globe. And I'll just point out a couple of trends. In orange, these are the niger kordofanian pop speaking populations I told you about that originated from West Africa. And they were surprisingly homogeneous. We actually didn't see a lot of variation amongst them, probably reflecting that recent spread from a common ancestor. In purple, we had the East African Afroasiatic speakers, and red Nilo-Saharan speakers like the Maasai, who interestingly we can trace to a homeland in southern Sudan, consistent with archaeological data. Um, one surprise, here we have populations from the region around Lake Chad who speak a language classified as Afroasiatic, but uh, genetically they didn't look anything like the Afroasiatic speakers. They looked like Nilo-Saharan speakers. So suggesting a possible language sw switch at some point in the past, and that was something that wasn't known before the study. Other things we can see are here the hunter-gatherers, the Hadza, the Sandawe. Um, pygmies are shown in dark green, and the San Bushmen from Southern Africa in light green. And one of the surprises is that one of the most Eastern pygmy groups seemed to show common ancestry with those San populations. So we've done a similar analysis in Africa, and to simplify it, I've just grouped together uh, individuals from certain geographic regions. And again, we can see that the pattern is, in orange are these niger kordofanian speaking populations. And we can see reflections of this migration 
to West Africa and then down south, and another migration into Southern Africa. We see a lot of diversity even within small geographic regions. And again, interestingly, here are the sun in this bright green, here are the pygmies of Central Africa, and there appears to be shared common ancestry. So that raises an interesting question. We have four of the most traditional hunting gathering populations remaining in Africa. They show evidence for common ancestry. Uh, other studies that we've done suggest that ancestry probably was predated at least 30,000 years ago, may have been closer to 50,000 years ago, and then they diverged. Three of these groups speak with cliques. The pygmies lost their indigenous language. So we wonder if perhaps pygmies originally spoke with the clique, and they may have lost that language. But um, very interesting, because linguistically, although they speak with cliques, they're very, very divergent, even linguistically. So we think this is a very old population split. I now want to tell you about two of the most um, admixed populations on a global level. The first one is the so-called self-identified um, Cape Colored population from Cape Town in South Africa. And what we see when we compare them to populations from around the world, we see almost equal ancestry from the San, Bushmen, South India, um, East Asia, uh, Europeans, and Bantu speakers. They are the most admix that we see in the whole uh, world, and it's reflecting the unique history of this population in Africa. Uh, it's known that the Afrikaners came in in the 1600s. They um, uh, admixed with some of the indigenous groups and had slaves for hundreds of years, and that's, we're seeing the reflection of that. But this is an exciting population for using some techniques that rely on this admixture to try to find genetic risk factors for disease. Here are African Americans, and what we see as expected based on the history of the slave trade, predominantly this West African Niger Kordofanian ancestry, but a lot of variability mainly in the amount of European ancestry, which ranges from zero to greater than 50%, but on average it's around 17%. We did another study, slightly different, where we pre-assigned, we said, let's assume these are the ancestral populations around the world, and now let's infer ancestry in the African Americans. And the main point I want to make is that African Americans, every individual we looked at, seem to have ancestry from two different regions of Western Africa. So suggesting that, that if we were to try to look at ancestry, there's a lot of the, um, ancestry testing being done, it's going to be very hard to trace back to a particular ethnic group because I predict that most people will trace back to multiple uh, regions. This is a study that is in press and PNAS, should be out hopefully in the next week or so, together with Carlos Bustamante at Cornell and a grad student, Kasia Brick. And what we did is we looked at now hundreds of thousands of markers in the genome and developed a method where we could actually, each of these bars represents a chromosome. And we could actually slide along the chromosome and look at ancestry and for ancestry. Here is um, someone who's representative of the African Americans we studied. In blue would be African ancestry, in red would be European, and green means mixed ancestry of that particular position. But what we see is a lot of variability. Here's someone who has predominantly African ancestry, Here's someone who has almost entirely European ancestry, and they self-identify as being African-American. And here's someone who has one parent who is of African origin, another of European origin. So this could have important implications also for personalized medicine studies in the future. Okay, let's see. My, I still have some time remaining. I want to tell you about our studies of the genetic basis of how people have adapted to very diverse environments in Africa. So here are four of the populations uh, that we've studied, and we can see that they live in very diverse climates, tropical, savanna. We have others we've studied from desert regions. Very diverse diets, hunter-gatherers, agriculturalists, pastoralists, and very different disease exposure. So what we, it would not be surprising then that these groups have undergone local adaptation. They've um, adapted to these diverse environments. And we're interested in finding essentially genetic footprints of that selection in the genome of these populations. Now, one of the reasons is, as an, someone with an anthropology background, I'm just interested in the knowledge of trying to, to know more about how we adapt to different environments. 
But the second reason is it's been hypothesized that many of the genetic variants that cause disease today, hypertension, diabetes, and so on, may have been common uh, in the past because they were adaptive. So it was actually a positive thing to have these variants in different hunter-gatherer environments. But today, with the Western diet and our environments, they're no longer beneficial. So it may help us to find some of these variants that play a role in common disease. And the study I'm going to tell you about is our study of um, the genetic basis of um, lactose tolerance in Africans and comparing with Europeans. So the ability to digest milk as adults is due to the expression of an enzyme called lactase fluorazine hydrolase, also just lactase for short. And it's expressed specifically from the small intestine. Um, and individuals who express this enzyme as adults, they can break down the sugar in milk called lactose into the components glucose and galactose. And those are rapidly taken up into the bloodstream. People who don't have an active form of the enzyme, they can't digest that. It's going to go into the lower gut and cause severe um, intestinal distress, including possibly diarrhea, which you can imagine in an African environment could be um, life-threatening. Now, um, in most mammals, they cannot drink milk as adults. We're quite unique in that respect. And in fact, most humans, actually, people don't realize that most people can't drink milk as adults. But we refer to people who have that enzyme turned on as having the lactase persistence trait or being, and being lactose tolerant. Those who don't have the enzyme um, are lactase non-persistent intolerant. Here we can see the prevalence of this lactase persistence trait um, across a number of populations. It's known to be most common in Finland and Sweden, the northern European countries. It decreases in frequency as we get more southern into southern Europe. And it's very low frequency in East Asia and West Africa. However, in populations that have a tradition of um, cattle domestication and dairying or herding, they're able to drink milk. Okay, so it's thought that this may represent a genetic adaptation in these different populations that have cattle. So in a really elegant study in 2002, a group from Finland finally found the genetic variant that was associated with the ability to drink milk in Europeans. People had been looking for many, many years. And it was very close to the gene for the enzyme lactase, but interestingly, it was in a non-coding region of another gene. That was one of the reasons it was so hard to find. And it is this variant right here, um, position minus 13910. If you have a T, you're able to digest milk. Now, we looked at that region in Africans, they didn't have it. So we knew there had to be something else going on. So in order to find other variants, uh, this is my former student, Quayley Powell. We actually measured the ability to digest milk using a lactose tolerance test. We gave the sugar and milk lactose. We then had to do a time test where everybody drinks this at one time, which is harder than it may appear. And then you use a, basically a diabetes monitor kit, and you just every 20 minutes look at the blood sh uh, sugar levels. In people who are lactose tolerant, they will have a rapid rise in blood sugar, okay, because they're able to digest that compound sh complex sugar lactose. Biomedical literature defines it as a rise of greater than 1.7 millimolar, and that's shown here. People who are intolerant are shown here, and then we have people who are intermediate. And in total, we found, here's the European variant, we found three new variants associated with this trait. The most common is about 100 nucleotides away from the one in Europe, and it's found mainly in Kenya and Tanzania. We also looked at a number of other genetic markers in the region that I'll show you about in a moment. If we look at, in light uh, blue, are the prevalence of people who can drink milk. And we can see it's most common in um, pastoralist groups such as the Beja from northern Sudan, but it's quite common throughout East Africa. So there's a lot of pastoralism in that region. And in colors are the uh, genetic variants associated with that trait, and we can see a pretty good correlation in this region. But in some of these populations, they don't have the genetic variants, but they can drink milk. So there has to be other variants out there that we're trying to identify. Now, this clearly was a very adaptive mutation to have. It was very positive because it left a whopping signature of genetic, uh, of natural selection in the genome, the strongest we've ever seen to date. 
Here are people who have two versions of that mutation that allows them to drink milk. And when you scan along their chromosomes, going up millions of nucleotides, they're identical for nu millions of nucleotides. And that is consistent with this mutation rising very rapidly in frequency in the population, uh, likely because it was beneficial. And in people who don't have that mutation, we don't see it at all. And here we have European, the European mutation associated with milk digestion in people who don't have it. And the other thing is that it clearly arose independently in Europe and in Africa. So we estimated the age of the mutation. And in Europe, we estimated it to be about 8,000 to 9,000 years of age. And in East Africa, we estimated it roughly 3,000 to 7,000 years of age. The two groups that had the oldest um, age estimate were the Nilotic speakers. These would include the Maasai, for example and Cushitic speakers who came from Ethiopia within the past 5,000 years. Now, we can't say for sure which group it arose in, but what is clear is there was a lot of genetic exchange between these groups, a lot of um, intermarriage or admixture going on. And um, together with the exchange of this cultural trait, of cattle domestication. So that's a good example of gene culture co-evolution. Um, more recently, a postdoc in my lab, Alessia Ranciaro, has actually sequenced this region in over a thousand Africans, and then she compared to the Middle East and Europe. I know it's hard to uh, interpret this. I'll just show you that these different colored bars represent different variants. We see this one that we identified very common in East Africa. Here's the European variant. We found some others that are common in the Middle East and North Africa. Interestingly, in South Africa, a couple of the populations had this East African variant, suggesting that pastoralism was brought into that region by an East African population. And in fact, we could trace the origins of these mutations. The one that's most common in Kenya and Tanzania appears to have arisen specifically in that region. Um, there's another one we found that we think arose in the Middle East and was introduced by migration into North Africa. And then there's another variant that appears to have originated in North Africa and then was introduced to the Middle East and other regions by migration. So if we look at the history of um, cattle domestication based on the archaeological record, it's really striking that these age estimates are so consistent. It's thought that um, domestication occurred first in North Africa or the Middle East roughly 7,000 to 10,000 years ago, consistent with our age estimate for the European variant, but wasn't introduced south of the Sahara until about 5,000 years ago, consistent with our date estimates in East Africa, and wasn't introduced until quite recently in Southern Africa. So um, I'm just going to end by thanking, first of all, the uh, many, many Africans who participated in this project, and many, many graduate students, postdocs, international collaborators. I have to also give special thanks to David and Lynn Sulfin, who are here today, for their generous support, which helped to make this possible. And I, also, I'd be a really negligent daughter if I didn't say thanks to my mother, who's here today, not only for her support, but for her genes as well. <laughs> and I'm happy to answer any questions. Resources where you can find out what your own genetic background is that you trust? Okay, well, those are two different questions. There are resources. So I think you know, one of the most well-known is 23andMe, a company in, uh, based in California. Um, I do trust them that they have a good team of scientists. The question is, uh, what can this genetic testing really tell us at this point? And I think it's a bit limited. So if you wanted to know, for example, where I showed you those different colors representing the different ancestral population, um, remember, at that resolution, I could only show, you know, Middle Eastern and European populations look similar. Nowadays, we act nowadays with um, more genetic markers, we actually can get pretty good resolution. We could say North, Northern Europe or Southern Europe, for example. Um, so you might be able to say, yes, I have European ancestry, and maybe you could say Northern European ancestry. You could certainly distinguish Jewish ancestry. That is very clear at this point, um, particularly Ashkenazi Jewish uh, individuals tend to cluster together in these analyses, and we can see similarities with um, Middle Eastern populations. So you could address those, but at the same time, if you're African American and you did one of these tests, it's likely going to say, guess what, your ancestors came from Africa, <laughs> and probably from West Africa. And then they might be somewhat disappointed, 
So then they could do some of these other tests where they look at mitochondrial DNA inherited through the maternal lineage or the Y chromosome inherited through the male uh, lineage. But I'm really, that I'm more skeptical about because very rarely can you trace that back to a particular ethnic group. The only one I could maybe tell you about is if you belong to some of these hunter-gatherer populations and very few people trace their ancestry to those groups. So most of the variants are found in a broad region and the problem I have is when there are claims made, I can trace your ancestry to that particular ethnic group. I don't believe it, not at this point. Without uh, hopelessly losing us, which I'm sure you could in an instant, um, can you give us a flavor as to what the definition of diversity is? You know, there are base pairs that are mm -hmm. distinct, there are groups of base pairs, there mm -hmm. are different genes. So if you can dumb it down for us, yeah. what, what's the <laughs> distinction? Question number two is, um, can you do this on a mitochondrial basis? And has anybody done it? And what conclusions, are, if you can, are different or distinct? OK. So um, the types of genetic variation, there's quite a bit of different types. But mainly, um, what people have studied are what's called single nucleotide changes. So if you're looking at a sequence and it has G, A, T, and C, there's a switch where maybe an A becomes a C, for example. And that's called, they sometimes refer to this as a single nucleotide polymorphism. You might hear that in the literature. The other type, I actually, one of the types of markers we looked at are these highly variable repeats. And what they are, the most simple case would be a repeat like CA, 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 CA. And people, someone, one individual, one chromosome might have 10 repeats and the other one might have four. And those have a very high mutation rate, so they're often used by forensic scientists. That's what they use in the OJKs, for example. And they're often, you know, the FBI would be looking at those types of markers. Um, then there are these structural rearrangements that I was telling you about. Some of those can be huge and can be visualized at the chromosomal level uh, with the right type of microscope, basically. But what we know less about are the tiny, tiny little insertion deletions. Those are very hard to capture, and we're working right now on methodology to look at that. Now, okay, the second question was mitochondrial DNA. That's been really well studied. <laughs> so the, mitochondrial, the mitochondria of our cells, which is the energy-producing um, center of the cell, has its own genome, and it's a circular genome. It's only 16,000 nucleotides compared to the 3 billion nucleotides uh, the rest of our genome. And my lab and others have actually now sequenced the entire mitochondrial genome. And it certainly is informative for tracing certain migration, paths of migration and ancestry, but it's also limited because you're only looking through maternal ancestry and it's just one region, whereas the rest of the genome, in the nuclear genome, there are three billion different <laughs> regions, each of which could have a different history and show a different picture. But they're complementary, I think, to each other. Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit about cause and effect on the genetic mutation in terms of, you know, the lactose tolerance and the, you know, pastoral communities? Mm -hmm. So the way this works, people often, it, we don't have a case where um, uh, there can be, there has to be underlying variation. Right? So there has to be variation that exists in the population just by chance, so just random mutations occur. If one of these randomly occurring mutations happens to be beneficial, meaning that you're more likely to survive to be an adult and you're more likely to have children, or maybe more children, and your children are more likely to survive to be adults and pass it on and so on, then we say it's adaptive and there can be positive natural selection to maintain that trait or to increase it in frequency. So now there's this big question, which came first, kind of the chicken or the egg? So <laughs> did the development of cattle domestication come first and then this mutation occurred or vice versa? We don't entirely know. Um, my best guess would be, I mean, I, I don't know, it may have even been simultaneous. What I find interesting though is that we see different variants in these different regions, which suggests to me that they may have been after the domestication event and then they occurred, and then they were selected to high frequency. Um, see, one way in the back. Do you think that over time, uh, um, diverse parts of the US, like New York, LA, will show uh, a different type 
development of the gene pool than more uh, homogeneous parts? Well, they're going to show this, you know, when I showed you those bars and different colors represent different ancestry, every person's going to have multiple colors. <laughs> I mean, so that's one of the effects. Um, but in terms of, you know, having lots of diversity from an evolutionary perspective is a good thing, actually. <laughs> we need diversity in the gene pool or we die out. <laughs> so one could argue it's really beneficial to have all this diversity in a population. So we can make that argument from an evolutionary perspective. Um, but some people have, one thing I forgot to mention is that um, I often give this as an example. People, reporters will often say, are humans still evolving? And I'll say, well, here's a great example that, yes, they are, the lactose tolerance, or looking at um, disease resistance, infectious disease resistance. But some could argue that culture has changed the path of that um, evolution in, in particular regions, and that's true. That's true as well. One other thing quickly. You showed that um, the uh, Scandinavians, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. were able to... Uh, uh, take in lactose more than others. Do you think that's because of the uh, shortage of vitamin D? That um, uh, Yeah, that was one of the hypotheses, was that it played a role in um, having calcium and um, uh, the lack of UV light, um, that it was needed for vitamin D production. Um, and uh, that could be, that's entirely possible. And that's a good question. What is the selective force? Why, why was it beneficial to be able to drink milk? And why haven't other places or people done that as well? We don't entirely know because it's not clear in um, Africa, for example. It might be for a different reason. So people have speculated that just having a source of um, water is really important, particularly amongst some of these desert tribes, having this constant source of liquid from um, cattle and from camels as well it could be very important but that's something we're still working on